This program is being presented to you by the Horaeus International Winter School on Gravity and Light. This is what we'll hear when we begin to listen to the universe. And this is what our galaxy will actually sound like. And it would sound like today if we could only listen to it. This cacophony of sound is what we expect from the most extreme objects in the universe. There are black holes, neutron stars, cosmic strings, and many, many more things, all shouting for our attention. At present, we're deaf. With our modern telescopes, we can see how beautiful our universe is. But there's another dimension, a different sense, which we'll soon be able to use. So as you heard, I'm Bernard Schutz, and I was for many years the director of the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics, also known as the Albert Einstein Institute. I'm now a professor at Cardiff University in Wales. The Albert Einstein Institute in Potsdam, near Berlin, Germany, it is very close to where Einstein developed his theory of general relativity. <coughs> this evening I'm going to be your guide to something you may never have expected to be able to do, which is to listen to a cosmic sound made by faraway objects in our universe. Of course, there's no air in between stars that carries this cosmic sound. We call it gravitational waves. There are small disturbances in the gravitational field that move through the universe at the speed of light. The, anything that changes gravity causes waves to ripple outwards. In the same way that ordinary sound is produced when air is disturbed, gravitational waves are produced when gravity is disturbed. We want to listen to these waves because they contain information about parts of the universe that we don't see, about things in the universe that don't shine at night. Now here's an analogy. Imagine that we're standing in a jungle with our earplugs in. We see the palms, the exotic plants. We see a waterfall, but we don't hear anything. Now the same again, but with the plugs out so we can hear sound. We quickly learn much more about the jungle, including its birds, apes, which were completely hidden before. And we might even hear something unexpected. Our universe is like a jungle. It's filled with wild animals. We can't see all of them. Often we only know that they're because we can listen to the sounds that they make. The wild animals of our junk universe are the true stars of this film. The cast includes 
ferociously exploding stars called supernovas, like nuclear explosions on, on the Earth, they convert some of their mass into energy, blowing themselves apart, but leaving behind a black hole or a neutron star. And some of that energy comes out in a short pop of gravitational waves. And we have lonely spinning neutron stars, cinders of a long ago supernova. We call them pulsars because they have radio beams turning like lighthouse beacons, giving us a radio pulse every time they sweep across us, spinning up to a fantastic 700 times a second. They go on like this for millions of millions of years, emispering, emitting a whispering pure tone of gravitational waves at hundreds or even thousands of cycles per second. And there are different kinds of pairs of stars, two ancient white dwarf binary stars orbiting one another once an hour, let's say, staying at such a safe distance from each other that they'll, continuing orbit, they'll continue their orbits for billions of years. Like pulsars, they emit pure tone whispers of gravitational waves, but at their much lower orbital frequencies. two neutron stars orbiting one another so closely that they merge together even as we listen to them. They explode emitting a blinding burst of gamma rays. They convert even more of their mass into a powerful scream of gravitational wave energy than they do into gamma rays. They leave behind a single quiet black hole. The biggest stars of our film are black holes. Their merger emits no light, only pure gravitational wave energy. In their death spiral, they radiate more, they radiate energy more brightly than the entire rest of the universe. Now black holes come in at least two sizes. There are big black holes and there are giant black holes. Big black holes are formed in supernova explosions, and they can have 10 times as much mass as our sun. Giant black holes are formed in the centers of galaxies, and they can have millions to billions of sun masses. The giant holes are truly the elephants in this jungle. And really fascinating are the mixed couples. Sometimes a neutron star pairs up with a big black hole, and sometimes a big black hole pairs up with a giant one. The giant one eventually eats the other one whole. Later I'll play for you the piercing scream that we expect to hear just before the big black hole disappears inside the giant one. Notice that these beasts, these stars of the jungle, are all dead objects, but they're also nature's most extreme objects. Black holes, for example, are pure gravity wrapped up into a ball that keeps growing. Listen to physicist Kip Thorne, who created the recent Hollywood movie Interstellar. If you go down near the edge of a black hole, time flows more slowly there, enormously more slowly than here on Earth. A few minutes of time down there, if you were there, could be a million years back on Earth. So what would happen if I would fall into a black hole? Would I end up somewhere else in another universe? You'd die. I'd die. <laughs> Inside a black hole, there's something we call a singularity. Singularity is a place where we don't understand what's going on. But we do know that gravity becomes so strong there that it rips you apart. It will rip the atoms that your body's made from apart. It destroys matter, it destroys all forms of matter, and it even destroys space and time right at the center. If you fall into a black hole, you die. Happily, people don't usually fall into black holes, but stars do. The last chance a collapsing star has to avoid this fate is to form a neutron star. Neutron stars are the densest objects we know. Inside a neutron star, the temperature can be millions of degrees. 
but it will still be a superconductor and a superfluid. Some physicists speculate that matter is in a different state inside neutron stars, technically known as strange matter. These gravitational wave emitters that we've seen, these are the growlers and howlers of our universe. They're places of extreme physics. We know of many such individuals already, but many others out there are hidden. We'll only discover and study them by listening to their gravitational waves. But almost certainly there are unknown beasts that we don't yet expect to hear even. Some may be associated, not with dead stars, but with birth, the birth of our universe. Physicists want to find relics left over from the Big Bang, and we want to listen to the gravitational waves emitted by the Big Bang. So, what are gravitational waves? So, gravitational waves are waves in space. They're waves of space. The medium really is space itself. Space is full of waves, from exploding stars, merging stars, spinning stars, and of course, black holes. Now, our computers can calculate what waves we should expect. With gravitational waves, we'll finally fully be able to observe the universe to listen for things hidden in the most remote corners and behind the thickest screens, and eventually even back to the Big Bang. Now remember, gravitational waves are not sound waves as we normally understand them, because there's no air between the stars to carry those sound. But space itself carries the gravitational disturbances to our detectors, and our computers can convert these disturbances into the sounds that we listen to. We've already heard one of these. This is the true music of the spheres. Now, warning, gravitational waves are not really as loud as that. In fact, they're the weakest and quietest waves science has ever tried to detect. We need very special ears to pick them up. Gravitational wave detectors. They are, in principle, ultra-sensitive microphones for gravitational waves. There are five big detector projects around the world, and they all work together. The two giant American LIGO observatories in the states of Louisiana and Washington. Virgo, another giant detector near Pisa, Italy, which is a cooperation among Italy, France and the Netherlands. The Kagura detector in Japan. The LIGO India project. And GEO 600, the German-British project near Hanover, Germany. GEO is operated by the Albert Einstein Institute in Germany. GEO is a kind of think tank. From here come key technologies that are transferred to the larger observatories. At many universities around the world, big supercomputers process the data. The biggest and fastest of them all is the Atlas Cluster at the Albert Einstein Institute. The first gravitational waves will be heard here.
the first system we detect will probably be a couple of tumbling and colliding neutron stars. In reality, they'll orbit each other much faster than shown here, and we expect to match them up with the spectacular gamma ray burst that they create. Here's, that was what we expected to hear, that little plop. It was only the part of the signal audible to our ears. Our computers will pick out in our data the much lower pitched whistle before it and we'll be able to identify it as a pair of neutron stars. We'll also be listening for the continuous wail of a rapidly spinning neutron star, what we call a pulsar. These waves are emitted when a misshapen neutron star spins. The bumps on it keep changing gravity as the star turns and the moving bumps create the gravitational waves. Once we've made these first detections, we need to do better. We will need to be able to make routine detections to explore the gravitational wave universe. In a study funded by the European Union, scientists have shown what the next stage must be. We have to go underground. The Einstein telescope would hear these gravitational wave sounds out to the edge of the known universe. To do that, it needs to be bigger, have more powerful lasers, but above all, be quieter. On Earth, quiet means deep, maybe 200 meters deep, and inside 10 kilometer long tunnels. That, of course, will be the future. Today, we're preparing the existing detectors all over the world to make the first ever detections. Now, I want to show you why we need detectors all over the world. Okay, I'm stopping the film, and uh, uh, we're going to have two demonstrations during the course of this film, and I'll be assisted in this by my two assistants, Claudia and Leon, who are, are going to now um, explain to you why we're going to do a demonstration for you, the three of us together, are going to do a demonstration to you, to you about why we have placed gravitational wave detectors all over the world, um, instead of just having a single detector. And the reason for that is we want to be able to tell where a gravitational wave sa sound, a gravitational wave, has come from. Um, so, uh, we are going to be three different black hole binary systems. And you are going to be the gravitational wave detectors. Uh, now, what we're going to do is we're going to make the sound of two black, ho of two black holes crashing together. You'll have to use your imagination to uh, accept that that's what we're doing. Uh, and then, um, uh, you're go I'm going to ask you to, to try to remember where that sound came from. So for this demonstration, I'd ask you to close, I'll, I will ask you in a moment to close your eyes and keep your eyes closed uh, as we move around and, and you uh, listen to the sounds. So each time these black holes crash together, I want you to remember only one simple thing. Um, uh, where did that sound come from? And uh, in, uh, could you tell the difference from, from one, one of these black hole systems to the, to the other as to where they came from? And then after that's all finished, we're all going to come together again. Then I will ask you to open your eyes and we'll, take, we'll talk about the result. We'll take a vote. We'll see, see what uh, you're able to do. Okay, so please, everyone, close your eyes and don't open them again until I ask you. Um, and now we're going to make three different uh, black hole collisions. And um, the uh, number one will be Leon. Number two is Claudia. Now keep your eyes closed. And I'm the number three. Now, if you can remember the, that where you thought those sounds were coming from, we're going to change our positions a little bit. And Again, um, okay, uh, and then again, 
Number one, number two, and number three. So those were the three black hole uh, events. Okay. Now, can you, you can open your eyes now, please. Oh, thanks. And um, I would uh, just like to ask, uh, how, many, how many people felt during the first three that all, all of these were in different locations? Right, okay, you have good ears, because they were. Uh, Liam, would you want to show us where you were standing for the first one? And Claudia? So this is, these were the positions we were in, okay. And um, now, for the second demonstration, again, how many people felt we, we were in distinct positions? And how many uh, felt we were, uh, that there may, maybe two of them were happening in the same place? Yeah. Okay, could you show us where you were? So, they were slightly apart, but they were close enough that, particularly if you were far away, you wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. Now, that's a very simple thing that we experience all the time with our ears, but it's exactly the same thing that happens with our gravitational wave detectors when we detect gravitational waves. The ears are using information like the arrival time of, of the gravitational wave, uh, sorry, of the sound. <laughs> uh, I wish we could detect gravitational waves with our ears. <laughs> But it arise with, uh, what time does the sound arrive at one ear and, uh, and the other? And the, and, and the nervous system is trying to work out those small time differences. It's also trying to work out intensity differences and so on. And all those things are part of the data that comes out of the gravitational wave detectors as well in order to locate on the sky. And, and you probably realize that uh, this all depends upon the wavelength of the sound. Um, that, uh, that uh, and how far away you are and, how f and what the distance is between your ears and so on, how big a distance you can resolve. And so in this case, they were not resolvable uh, if, you were, if you were far enough away. Um, if you were close, then the angle is better and, and, and so you could tell. So um, the same thing is true of our gravitational wave detectors. We have rather crude positions on the sky because our detectors are not separated by very much just the size of the Earth and the size of the gravitational wavelength is really quite long. So um, that's, uh, that's the demonstration that explains, anyway, why we take great care to position detectors, multiple detectors, all working together in different places. So we have two in the United States, one in Europe, one in India being built, one in uh, Japan being built. So thank you very much for the demonstration. And we'll have another one uh, later on, um, uh, which... Uh, uh, um, my, the, my able assistants will also help me with. So thank you very much. Um, so, okay, so now I can restart the film. So, there's more gravitational wave astronomy than just the gravitational wave sounds that we'll be able to detect with the detectors that we're building on the Earth, as you saw in that film earlier. We'd also listen to, to the universe in a lower frequency range. It's a bit like astronomers who want to have a view of the entire universe in different wavelengths, like X-rays here. If you look at the whole sky, the same universe in optical, you get a very different view of it. And again, if you make a map of the same universe, of the entire sky in radio, it looks very different. It's the same in gravitational waves. Gravitational waves come in different wavelengths, and for each wavelength we need a different kind of detector. The interesting gravitational wavelengths are much longer than those of light or radio waves. Um, in fact, uh, our detectors on the ground are um, uh, looking for wavelengths that are only a little bit bigger than the Earth. So, that's the, why we have trouble resolving their distances, their positions. We need to put a detector in orbit around the sun if we want to look for waves this, which are the scale of the solar system. And if we want to look for really long wavelengths, comparable to the separations between stars, we need to use the stars themselves, the neutron stars that we call pulsars. The pulses of, radiate, of radio waves emitted by these neutron stars can help us to measure gravitational waves because some pulsars are very, very good clocks. Their pulses arrive at Earth with such precise regularity that by monitoring several pulsars at once, 
we can look for gravitational waves passing the Earth. As the w waves stretch and distort space, they change the distance that the pulses have to travel to reach us. So some pulses are delayed relative to others, and that allows us to detect the gravitational waves that produce those delays. We call this pulsar timing. It can detect waves with ultra-long wavelengths, several light years in length, that are emitted when two of the giant black holes that we talked about earlier with billions of sun masses orbit each other very closely. By about 2020, radio observatories in Europe, the USA, and Australia may find these slow, tiny arrival time variations below a millisecond that are the telltale signature of gravitational waves from the biggest black hole. But we'll soon be, be de begin detecting the Earth size and the light year size gravitational waves, which will be the major milestones for physics and astronomy. But the richest harvest of all will come when we can look for in-between sizes, the solar system size <coughs> gravitational waves. We'd love to do that with detectors on the ground, but we've already built that we've already built, but we have lots of problems on the ground, and one of them is weather. Um, our detectors are ultra sensitive to changes of gravity, no matter how they arise. And weather can change gravity. I'm not talking about lightning or thunder, but about atmospheric pressure and temperature changes. These can change the density of the air that's above the detector. And as they change, as they pass over the detector, they change gravity by more than the gravity changes from gravitational waves from distant black holes. So to measure our long gravitational waves, we have to get away from the Earth. We will also be able to measure gravitational waves in space. The European-led LISA mission will listen deeper into the universe and farther back in time than ever before. By going out into empty space, LISA can be made much bigger than the Earth-based detectors. This allows LISA to pick up waves of much longer wavelengths, which are emitted by much larger objects, such as giant black holes orbiting one another. In order to make such sensitive observations, the LISA spacecraft will create inside themselves the quietest places in the solar system. Only if we exclude all local disturbances can we record the sounds made by distant beasts. With three ultra-quiet spacecraft in a triangle a million kilometers on a side communicating among themselves with lasers, LISA becomes the most sensitive detector ever built. LISA will hear a cacophony of sounds from all over the universe, from white dwarf stars in our Milky Way to the roaring elephants of the giant black hole systems far away and far back in time. LISA might even record the earliest black holes, or even the Big Bang. Even the mysterious dark energy might leave its mark in LISA's observations. And LISA's gravity measuring technology is going to be used to study the Earth. Too. The GRACE follow-on mission uses technology developed for LISA to measure the small irregularities in the Earth's gravity with unprecedented precision. It can detect underground mineral resources, monitor changes in water resources and measure the rate of glacier melting. A future generation network of Earth orbiting satellites could measure changes in the Earth's gravity so small that they could register in real time the changes in rocks deep underground that might signal an imminent earthquake or volcano. Just as Einstein's fundamental studies of atoms led eventually to the laser and all its applications from DVD players to medicine, so also may Einstein's theory of gravitational waves inspire new measurement systems with an unimagined range of applications. With LISA, we want to put three detectors into a triangular array. Each pair of arms is an independent detector, like one of the detectors on the ground. But these detectors overlap, so we can't easily tell the direction to a gravitational wave source in the same way as we did in our demonstration and with the ground-based detectors. Instead, LISA will use the Doppler effect. In other words, 
from the changes in pitch as the sound of, of the gravitational wave sounds as Lisa circles the sun. Watch this animation. Let your ears tell you just when the train passes the crossing. So you hear the crossing bell change just as you pass it. Lisa will locate its sounds in the same way through the changes in their pitch as it circles around the sun. So our gravitational wave detectors use the same old tricks that our ears have always used in order to listen and locate sounds. The tricks may be old, but gravitational waves are new. Nobody's detected one yet. What we know about them comes from how Einstein changed Newton's theories about gravity. It was Isaac Newton, of course, who showed in the 17th century that gravity was the reason that the planets stayed in their orbits around the sun. Today we understand that gravity governs the development of the entire universe. Einstein recognized that gravity is in fact the curvature of space, or more precisely, space-time. Space is no longer just the arena in which things happen, it's an active participant. And Einstein asked himself, what happens when stars circle each other? How does gravity change when the stars move? And do these changes affect other bodies around them? Einstein, of course, already knew that nothing can move faster than light. Therefore, he concluded that changes in gravity had to move through space at the speed of light, taking the form of waves. Any, any theory of gravity has to have waves. Einstein's gravitational waves are ripples in the curvature of space. Space, of course, is everywhere. That means gravitational waves go everywhere. They can't be shut out, screened away, blocked. They are therefore the best messengers that we have from the dark and hidden universe. Every acceleration produces gravitational waves. We can, however, only catch the strongest of these waves, the ones that are emitted by the fastest and most massive objects in the universe, <coughs> from black holes, neutron stars, exploding stars, and the Big Bang itself. And these waves typically can only just be detected because their sources are so far away. And the waves are very weak by the time they reach us. So now we're going to do our second demonstration. And this time we're going to use this rope. And Claudia and Leon, Leon are going to position themselves. We hope we can, we can show you um, uh, exactly why, um, so let, let's try to get more, if, if you can stand back here, yeah, and then the first part, the first part is, is about there, yeah, that's right, we'll do it with half the length. Now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to show you why Newton didn't come up with the idea of gravitational waves, but Einstein did. And um, uh, so what I want you to imagine is that this rope is gravity or it's space, which is going to carry, wave, carry gravity and carry waves of gravity. So we're going to look at the waves that are on this rope. Um, and uh, uh, Claudia is the source of the gravitational wave. She's an, uh, being a black hole binary again. Um, and this time, Leon is the detector. So the waves are going to go, come from her and go to him. Uh, so um, when she pulls on her on the rope, that's like the gravitational attraction. Uh, uh, that one object exerts on another, and then she's going to change the gravity. So as she moves the rope up and down, you can imagine gravity getting a bit stronger or getting a bit weaker as the source, as the two stars are moving around, and sometimes they're a bit closer to you and sometimes a bit further away and so on. So um, the, the changes in gravity are being represented by the change in uh, um, the position of the rope. So... Um, uh, Let's do the first experiment. So uh, they're not very far apart. And um, when the black hole orbits, uh, that'll make gravity stronger and weaker. And uh, let's see what happens. Yeah. So what happens is that, do it again. That's right. What happens is pretty much instantaneously, uh, the, the, when, when Claudia changes gravity over here, 
uh, Leon feels it. Uh, you, you don't see a wave running along here. The rope is just stiff and it's just happening. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is now I'm going to ask Claudia to go twice as far away. As far as you can get in the room. That's it. That's good. And we've rehearsed this, but it's very, diff it's very difficult to do. I, I, what we're trying to do is move the rope in exactly the same way and keep the tension in the rope exactly the same. But just because the rope is longer, um, uh, see if you can uh, see that there's a some, somewhat of a delay in the, um, uh, in, in, in the reaction at this end when the gravity changes at that end. Yeah. So I think you could see a wave travel down the rope. And that means that uh, because the rope is, just because the rope is longer, you're seeing that wave. When the rope was shorter, we were less than a wavelength uh, uh, of rope in front of us, and, and the rope was pretty much moving <coughs> as a unit. But now, try it again. Uh, do, do the same thing again. Now there's a somewhat of a wave motion going along there because we're, we've got more rope to play with. And so the further away, the, the longer the delay, and, and when it gets to be uh, comparable to uh, when, the, when the travel time is comparable to the time of lifting the rope and so on, um, then uh, the wave effect becomes visible. Now, that's a rope. It has a very slow wave speed. Gravity, of course, has very high wave speed. Gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. That's the fastest you can go. So now we're going to try to duplicate. We're going to try to simulate that, or at least uh, uh, make something that looks like that, by changing the tension in the rope. We're going to pull on the rope as hard as we can. So now we have a very tense rope and there, therefore a, a higher speed uh, uh, along the wave. And Claudia is again going to be her black hole binary and again try to change the same thing, change it with the same motion as she did before. And you see it vibrate, but you, I, don't, I don't see a wave going along there. I see it happening pretty much uh, the same everywhere. Okay, this is a very simple demonstration. Thank you very much. Thank you for both of your demonstrations. <laughs> this is a very simple demonstration, of course, <coughs> but of a profound principle about waves, which is that uh, uh, wave motion, wave effects are only visible in what uh, in what we call the far zone and not in the near zone. They're only f visible if you're far enough away for the waves, let's say a, if you're a wavelength uh, away, and that depends on the speed of the waves and it depends upon how fast gravity is changing, for example. So if things are changing slowly, then the wavelength is very long and you have to be very far away to appreciate it. Um, and so um, now if I go back to uh, the discussion between <laughs> Einstein and Newton, um, remember that Einstein changed Newton's theory to put in the delay, but only a delay that travels with the speed of light, which is very, very fast. And so um, Newton, in, he wanted to explain the solar system. He built the first reflecting telescope. He made observations of the planets himself. And he discovered the law of gravity that would explain the motions of the planets. But the planets moved very slowly in their orbits compared to the speed of light. So gravitational waves that they produce have very, very long wavelengths, light years. The wavelength is much, much bigger than the solar system. So the experiment we just, we just did shows that gravity in the solar system isn't affected by gravitational waves. There's no evidence of gravitational waves in our solar system. And it's not surprising that Newton didn't incorporate them into his theory. His theory didn't need them. He didn't include them. But today, we know about cosmic objects that move very, very fast. For example, black holes and neutron stars in orbits close, close to one another can be going at speeds, uh, a good fraction of the speed of light. So we need a theory that has, gray, that has waves, and that's what Einstein's general theory of relativity gives us. Remarkably, the French <coughs> physicist Laplace speculated about gravitational waves around the year 1800. He believed gravity had to have a finite speed and he understood that this would lead to waves. But it took another century before Einstein could make a full theory of gravity that had the waves and quantitatively was correct. This film shows what they are like.
Gravitational waves stretch and squeeze space as they fly through the universe. They change the distances between points in space. Our laser interferometers measure the tiny changes in length that they create. Gravitational waves affect all objects because they affect space itself. A given gravitational wave always produces the same change in shape, no matter how big or small the system. Therefore, we build the biggest possible detectors so that the stretching is as large as possible. Even so, it's a huge technological and scientific challenge to detect these gravitational waves. Even the biggest stretching remains very small and measuring it is, is tough. So we want to listen to the universe. We aren't there yet, but step by step we're improving the sensitivity of our detectors and our microphones for these gravitational waves. Within just one or two years, we may well begin to listen to these wild animals of outer space. And when LISA is launched, we will get the strangest and the loudest gravitational wave sounds ever. With LISA, we will listen to the collisions and merging of giant black holes. And we also create events in, these events in our supercomputers by solving Einstein's equations. And we will learn a lot from these simulations. Exotic as they seem, black hole binaries are among the simplest and cleanest systems in nature. From their gravitational waves, we can read off the masses of the holes, how strong the waves are, that they are emitted, and even exactly how far the system is away from us. Solving Einstein's equations on a supercomputer as here shows us what these events look like. In their final orbits, in the final moment of merging, two black holes are emitting energy faster than everything else in the entire universe put together. Light energy, x-rays, everything is less energy in luminosity than that black hole binary. Now here we see a giant black hole with a smaller black hole in orbit around it. With LISA, we'll listen to the dying moments of this smaller black hole as it's being eaten by the giant one. Because this kind of merger takes much, much longer than, than, than it does when the holes are the same size, we get a much, more, uh, a much richer amount of information. And we can use it to test Einstein's theory. What we're hearing is the, a year of expected LISA data compressed to a minute in order to raise the pitch of the signal into the audible range. This music of the spheres, it's not very musical, but its complexity contains all that information about the orbit and about the central black hole. And the most important part was that. It stopped. That's the proof that the central object was a black hole. That's the proof that the orbiting object fell inside and disappeared. The silence that follows is the best proof that we have that black holes really exist. Lisa will actually hear much more than this. The data that we're listening to here, if we can hear it, um, it's a bit low. Uh, I apologize for that, but this is, this is the whole sound of the entire galaxy. It includes mergers of distant black holes, but also binary systems in our own galaxy. Now this is what we expect to hear when eventually we can listen to the very beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. Listening to this hiss is the ultimate prize of gravitational wave astronomy. Are you disappointed? Did you expect a large bang from the Big Bang? Remember, this is 14 billion years ago. The source is 14 billion light years away. It's a very quiet, persistent hiss of gravitational waves reaching us. But it's the ultimate prize. It's what we all want to detect. Now, these are radio waves from the Big Bang, the, the my cosmic microwave background. We want to be able to detect the gravitational waves also in the cosmic microwave background. 
which are the radio waves coming out of the Big Bang, and BICEP-2 claimed to have detected these last year. But the European Planck satellite showed that what they had been misled by was foreground uh, effects in the polarization of the, of the microwaves, so that the polarization wasn't that was what would have been induced by gravitational waves. But in a, another year or two, we may well be able to detect the gravitational waves in the Big Bang itself from the polarization. Now, the beginning of gravitational wave astronomy will be a breakthrough that gives us a tool with which we'll be able to observe hidden regions and as yet unknown monsters in our jungle. As in other areas of astronomy, we get the best results when we bring together other ways of observing as well. For instance, uh, gamma ray satellites that will work with LIGO and Virgo to tell us what causes the bursts of gamma rays that they're constantly detecting. We call this multi-messenger astronomy. In the next decade, astronomers will be using their newest and most powerful telescopes, as we saw the extremely large telescope and the square kilometer array of radio telescopes about to be built. They'll follow up gravitational wave events, study their environments, learn how they formed, and find out what effects they've had on their surroundings, how, how black holes, for example, shaped our own galaxy. What else will we learn from these technologies? as we put them together and, and match them up with telescopes to reveal the hidden and dark side of our universe. When we use our gravitational waves to listen, we hear the dynamic universe, and the universe is dynamic. It's a restless universe. Nothing stands still. Nothing is at rest. The universe is filled with things in motion, all of it radiating gravitational waves. Thank you very much.